But yesterday we talked about some spine classifications and the basic principles in the philosophy of Dr. Zirkel to simplify things. And I hope I can give some simple uh, thoughts about this. Before I get this uh, going, I'm very privileged to work here because this is truly a globally oriented um, uh, organization here at SSF and at SNI. Uh, I just want to show you something. Just uh, two weeks ago, we had a visiting surgeon from Baghdad, Iraq, Dr. Baswan Bayati, and he spent two weeks with us, and uh, we had a great time with him. And he also gave a lecture, and so far he's had only 108 views, but after today, I hope uh, he'll get many more. Um, but he's so proud of his experience here, and. Uh, uh, we are privileged to have him here. This was done through an AO grant, and he had unlimited uh, access uh, to everything. And again, we really hope that we'll have uh, people from your communities, uh, colleagues, uh, come here in the future and spend uh, time with us. So uh, uh, this is just a little pitch for um, uh, more or less exchanging global communities. A delegation of us will actually go to Kenya uh, next week, and I think one of my colleagues, Dr. Falakoff, is going to go to Ethiopia to the Black Lion Hospital in Addis Ababa, right? So simplified approach in the spirit of Dr. Zirkel. And in terms of spine trauma care, again, we are acutely connected uh, to two elements. It's patient survival and spinal cord injuries. And uh, I've shown this slide yesterday. This is actually an artwork in Seattle. Uh, the outcomes of a broken spine are deformity, pain, spinal cord injury, and death. One of the classic problems of spine care is the horizontal crucifixion. Uh, leaving patients basically in this kind of a quagmire state, uh, covered with bandages, uh, unexaminable, and we don't really know what's going on. All of us know that the best position for a patient who's had polytrauma is as soon as possible getting them into the upright. The other principle from yesterday is trying to understand the spinal column. I've made a pitch yesterday that a lateral C-spine x-ray is and remains the single most efficient x-ray uh, to make sure that there's no trauma, 90 to 95%. Uh, this is a case that was missed at Harborview, and again, sometimes we do need AP x-rays. What really matters is our examination skills. Uh, this man actually got his head caught in a trash dumpster and had his head pulled off. And again, this was totally missed on a lateral, uh, but in those days we still got APs. And AP x-ray, if your clinical suspicion is high, is still a very meritorious supplementation, especially for the vulnerable transition zones of the cervical thoracic spine and the thoracolumbar junction. So this is still something that you want to consider if your lateral transition zone conventional imaging is not there. I've shown this uh, image. This is uh, uh, actually one of our ORs is equipped like this downstairs. I can actually supplement this with a picture downstairs. This is uh, obviously the dream, but again, this is not a reality that we can all live with. Um, the principle was just outlined by Dr. Connor Cleveno, and I'm going to repeat him here. It's better to have a bad hip uh, than be dead. And again, we should not harm patients with whatever we do. For spine injuries, the timing of care, especially in terms of survival and spinal cord injury, is very important. That's the first thing I want to bring up. I showed this slide yesterday, and again, for me, this is a, an important philosophy in terms of uh, trying to take care of patients. The stone after the throw, you can't recover that. The word after it's said the occasion after it's missed, and the time after it's gone. And all of these, especially the last two, so much pertain to spine and serious spine injury care. All of us now know that based on animal research, but also increasingly uh, available clinical data, there's a golden time period for spinal cord injury patients. And it's an impossibility nearly in most clinical settings, even in the so-called glorious USA, uh, to get the magic time of six to eight hours uh, from the time of a dislocation or a serious cord impingement to decompression. Uh, 24 to 48 hours is probably as good as it gets, but if you have the rare circumstance of having a freshly dislocated neck in your facility, you can change that person's life. You can change their cord by effectively decompressing it. What's the best time to operate? Every single thing that we have done, I've published some of those with some great colleagues, from around the world, everything that we know is an early surgery is better than a late surgery. And I'm going to show you some of the data slides on that. Um, the classic fear was that we incur greater bleeding in the beginning and that we operate into a patient with unclear neurologic status. And all of us dread something. This is actually from a case of mine in the past. Uh, this kind of a picture where we're accumulating expensive um, blood uh, preservation and substitution uh, resources on a patient in an early surgery. 
If we wait too long, this is the picture of a famous football player in America who had an acute spinal cord injury. And basically, he was uh, actually had the fortune in his misfortune of being in a major urban center. Uh, he clearly needed an emergent surgery for his thoracic spine. His agent um, had him flown to Florida. Uh, and uh, this two-day delay basically killed him. He had a, a PE uh, one day after his surgery. Uh, he should have had surgery in that uh, particular city with a very competent surgeon there who should have reduced his spine, but he had no chance despite him trying to do so because his agent said, oh, I'm going to fly you to Miami, Florida with a private jet. So bad things happen if we wait. When should we intervene? Well, again, we have our own um, uh, restrictions, but basically most surgeons uh, nowadays try to operate as fast as possible, especially for incomplete patients. The verdict is not clear on complete patients. Most of us concede that in centers uh, where we're having to deal with competing trauma interests, such as abdominal injuries or head injuries, it's not realistic to get into the operating room within about a day. It's a, it's a reality that's very sad and very difficult for us, despite the life-changing events of spinal cord injuries. Here we're in a blessed state in a hospital which allows us to literally go at moment's notice, but I realize that's not common. But we have other things available, for instance, for the cervical spine. This is a real-life story. It's a 39-year-old patient. He was in Asia A. He had a dislocation, as you now know from yesterday, a bilateral facet dislocation. He had a complete spinal cord injury, Asia A, motor score 6. And again, we basically did not get an MRI. We did not get a CT. We reduced him uh, within three hours of his injury. And it's just one of those classic stories. We got an MRI. We played with him anteriorly. He literally walked out of the hospital uh, four days later. And this is something that we can do. And this is, again, once you've seen this, you become very convinced how important it is to be swift and fast. Uh, early reduction, we've published on this. Uh, several people have published on this. You don't need a C-arm, but you need a traction set up with a neck inflection uh, to make this happen. And you need to have a simple protocol to do this. Again, there are several publications that have shown this. One was from Harborview. And this is the miracle device number one. These are Gardner Wells tongs. We prefer those over Crutchfield tongs. Um, they cost about $200. Uh, they have a little pop release. And um, uh, this is, again, uh, a very helpful device. The safe spot of application is behind the temporal artery and behind the temporal fossa. So to teach this to my residents and fellows, I basically put my hands onto the temporal fossa and anything above the external auditory meatus below the horizon line of the head um, is uh, relevant uh, and is helpful. You don't want to be above the uh, uh, equator of the head. Just for completeness sake, if you have halo rings, the magic spots are behind again the external auditory meatus and on the lateral third of the eyebrow. So you want to avoid the frontal sinus, you want to avoid the supraorbital nerve. So again, anything in the lateral third of the eyebrow in front of the temporal fossa is good. Again, for teaching purposes, the best thing to do is put your fingers onto the temporal fossa, put your thumbs on the mastoid, and anything in between there below the horizon line goes and is okay for pins. And if you need six pins or eight pins, that's okay. So the do's of retraction, the sooner the better. You don't want to have patients in muscle spasms from pain. Ideally, you have an awake, responsive patient. You ideally don't do this on a patient who's asleep. You want to make sure they get oxygen because the spinal cord needs oxygen. You want to have the blood pressure, ideally with a MAP, a median um, arterial pressure of above 80. You want to have muscle relaxants. If you have pulse oximetry, it's nice to monitor the oxygenation. You want to make sure you don't have a skull fracture. You want to make sure you don't have distractive injuries. You want to put the neck into a flexed position, so not straight like with this image erroneously shows. You want to have a lateral x-ray. You want to have the shoulders in pull down or put straps around the wrist so you can do a pull down. You start with zero traction, get an x-ray, hang it up. You then go in 10 pound intervals, bit by bit until you disengage the neck. You re-examine the patient. Probably 50 to 80 pounds is the maximum. If you can't reduce them by then, you have already done a great deal because you've disengaged the spinal canal and taken away the kinking part. So this is a really big deal. Even if you have no perfect reduction, you've decompressed the spinal cord. And this is, again, what you want to see. You disengage the neck, and you then snap it over the end. No manipulation. So this is a safe and effective, and again, 
if you have MRIs, if you have CTs, if the patient is neurologically intact or if the patient is unconscious, you can get these studies first, but you don't want to delay a reduction of a spinal cord injury patient. Things to look for again, you don't want to have a skull fracture over the parietal bones. So this is a case, an example. This comes from Harborview, where I used to practice for 25 years, and this is a depressed skull fracture. Now, not every skull fracture is a contraindication, but skull fractures in this lateral side of the skull are a no-go zone. If you have some split somewhere here and you can identify that, that's not a contraindication. But these are a problem. And the other thing is if you identify a distractive injury, that's where there's a vertical disengagement of the spine, that is obviously also a contraindication. And if you don't do that, this is again a case from my past, uh, you'll see this and you don't want to have this. This patient actually died because there was bilateral vertebral artery dissections. So if you see a distractive injury, no traction. And these patients are a surgical emergency. As I said yesterday, we have more and more patients with ankylosing spondylitis. That's the third contraindication. So this is a frozen spine. It's also known as Forestier's disease. If you put traction on this patient, you have to be ultra careful. In this patient, the well-intended traction led to a kinking of the spinal cord. The patient was paralyzed. So in ankylosing spondylitis, if you identify that and have that, the patients usually need to be a little bit in flexion. And traction is more or less an exclamation mark, a warning sign that you have to watch the spine and be careful. So one of the big fears of uh, 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 traction has been that we dislodge a disc into the spinal canal or an epidural hematoma or bone fragments. And again, this is a very rare thing. Some surgeons said it's common, but if you actually apply this traction protocol, it's almost unheard of. And again, you just don't manipulate patients. You don't do chiropractics on a dislocated neck. You do everything with axial traction and gentle compression. So these are the main papers that support this. And I think all things considered, if you have a spinal cord injury, if I'm a spinal cord injury patient in your center, I want an urgent reduction done, period. I don't want to wait. One thing that has been suggested is to do an anterior decompression uh, of a dislocated neck. This is actually a very difficult procedure. I've done these, um, and I always get a consent on patients. If I want to go anterior, I can't reduce them from the back to go anterior and posterior. This is obviously very elegant, and we'll do an anterior neck exposure with Dr. Drazen on our uh, cadavers later. But um, to try to reduce an anterior neck is a pretty difficult procedure and can be very uh, um, uh, 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 imposing. I think in general, a posterior decompression is way more controlled. You can use clamps and reduce the neck very controlled. So this is the story I showed you before, and again, um, this is truly magic. This is one of those magic moments uh, in spine surgery where you've truly changed a life from wheelchair or death to function. I wanted to bring up timing. So we did a very large paper on timing. And again, one of the very big things that we saw is the longer we wait, the higher the incidence of respiratory failure is. And again, our spinal column and our lungs are intimately entwined with one another. The health of our um, lungs is very determinant on our survival also. So the longer we wait from trauma, the more we face a significant pulmonary deterioration. And we've determined uh, with a very large study of over 1,000 patients that the worst case scenario is if you wait more than two days, you have a patient over 35 years, you have some form of a head trauma with a GCS below 12 and pulmonary injury, you're gonna have a very high chance, a much higher chance of dying. And if you have the opposite, you have an almost non-existent chance of dying. So these are very powerful numbers, and they have a, a very solid political, um, uh, sorry, statistical uh, merit to them. So, and the same numbers came from Germany, surprisingly, and a, a different group from Dr. Fizan's hospital. <clears throat> so the longer you wait, uh, the more of a problem you have. Um, in terms of larger papers, early versus late, early being within 48 hours, Again, the preponderance of literature nowadays really supports the concept of trying to do thoracolumbar trauma surgery within two days. Um, so this is, again, a classic example. This is a burst fracture, and uh, we basically went in posteriorly first, and then uh, we put it in a small, short screw into the burst segment, which was a newer development, and we can practice that in the lab. So just a little 30 uh, millimeter screw 
and this will biomechanically make him much stronger. And we then simply waited until this very sick patient became better, and we then did an anterior cage procedure later. And you can use an iliac crest bone graft, or if you have organ donor bone, and there are many other options to do, but you don't have to rush into an anterior surgery in these burst fractures very rapidly. The main thing you want to avoid if you do spine trauma surgery is do your best to avoid a secondary hypotension because that disproportionately damages nerve tissue. You don't want to have your anesthesiologist over-infuse the patients. I talked about the Parkland burn formula yesterday. And you want to be efficient. All of you are spectacular surgeons. I could see that yesterday in every report that I got from the labs. You're very special and especially talented surgeons. You want to be in a two to three hour time window to do your trauma surgery. And don't do anterior acute thoracolumbar surgery. It's just not a very safe surgery. So some treatment principles of thoracolumbar fractures. And again, our European colleagues from Germany and from England kind of set the stage for this. And again, we can be way more probably um, useful of braces. The recent data on neurologically intact patients who have an intact PLC and are not dislocated really supports that we can probably use far more non-operative care. It's very rare for patients to have a secondary neurologic decline. And again, my suggestion is that if you have any doubts, you can use the upright test. Put them into a brace see how a patient does. If they can tolerate it over a day or two, that's great. If they cannot tolerate the upright position but they're comfortable with recumbent, rethink your approach. And again, a secondary neurologic deterioration is actually very rare. So don't operate on all fractures. I'm embarrassed to say that in my home country of Germany now, doing surgery for fractures uh, in the thoracolumbar spine has become second nature. Every fracture just about gets some surgery, and it's, it's sadly a perversion of AO as always operate, which is not necessary and not supported by the literature. So no spinal cord injury, bony injuries, or injuries below L3, you can usually really treat non-operatively. Now let me tell you, I love casts. I, I don't know whether it's applicable in your countries. Frequently the uh, temperature will not be, um, uh, the tropical climates will not be commensurate to that. But I still think one of the most powerful things for patients who are neurologically intact is a hyperextension cast. This is something that a colleague of mine sent me from Bhutan. Uh, I've put plenty of casts on patients, and I still put hyperextension casts on patients. This works for neurologically intact patients who you need to keep inclined, and it's actually a very uh, powerful thing. Now, we don't use the two-bed theory, but we have a table for that, but it still works. So in terms of thoracolumbar trauma, how to do this and what to do, um, basically, my personal preferences nowadays lie between treating them non-operatively if they're neurologically intact, or doing this or this. On an acute basis, I recommend against anterior options, and if at all, for devastating injuries, a combined staged, meaning posterior first and then anterior procedure, is a very applicable route by putting short screws into the burst segments. Practical tips. So dislocations. Basically, for dislocations, this is an excessive use of screws, but I think that two above, two below, gives you a very powerful reduction tool and works very well. Uh, if you have an ill patient, and again, you really have a devastating injury, um, staging is a very powerful thing. Um, I would suggest doing a short segment, and, um, one above, one below fixation, two rods, crossings, do a decompression. We'll practice that in the lab today how to do an efficient posterior, and then ventral disimpaction, and then wait. You can sit the patient up. This is not going to heal. This is going to break apart. But this is a ventral disimpaction with simple tools. And basically then when the patient is healthy, you can bring them back. This is an organ donor bone. Uh, this is a very, for our country, a very inexpensive uh, device. But you have about two weeks' time to do this anterior part of the procedure in a very controlled fashion. What you want to avoid is, and again, Anthony was superb in picking up the flexion distraction injury yesterday. You don't want to miss flexion distraction injuries. These are the simplest things to fix, one above, one below. You'll make a life happy, and you'll avoid this with a painful uh, kyphosis that's fixed that you then have to, at a later date, do a very complex uh, reconstructive surgery. So comparing this kind of a construct, which was what we had to do to repair this missed flexion distraction injury, to a simple one screw above, one below construct is incomparable. So 
Uh, failures of short segment fixations are feared. This is a classic case of a burst fracture. It was nicely treated with posterior screws only. There are several ways that we could have avoided this collapse. We could have put short screws into this patient, or we could have uh, done a secondary anterior corpectomy. Um, this is, again, the final result. So short segment fixation alone can work, but you either have to put the patient into a cast, or you have to put an anterior graft in, or in the future use short segment screws here to try to uh, decrease the cantilever effect. In terms of the neck, if you have a dislocated neck like this, what should we do first? Again, it's become very popular in our country to do anterior surgery. It's very atraumatic, the patient is supine. It's a very simple approach, and we'll practice that in the lab today, and I'll give you some tips on this. But the problem here is the devil's in the detail. This was, again, not well recognized that there was a splaying of the ligaments above this. Stay with simple things, a lateral x-ray, palpation would have shown that there's an injury above. This patient started slipping off and failing, and basically had an interspinous ligament injury, and we had to go in from posterior to fix this patient. Not a big deal, but remember that anterior-only fixation for dislocations is prone towards failures. The most powerful fixation is posteriorly for the neck. So summary for C-spine trauma, I strongly suggest uh, you get, and these are very affordable. Maybe Lou can develop some newer, simpler GW tongs if you don't have them, and uh, we can share a protocol with you. Anterior, uh, uh, sorry, dislocations, put them into traction, get a reduction. Uh, for a short segment of fixations, anterior is preferred. If there's a non-reduced uh, uh, fracture dislocation, posterior is the way to go. For the thoracolumbar spine, structurally speaking, the PLC, the posterior ligamentous complex integrity, is key. For burst fractures, fractional distraction injuries, posterior short segment fixation, one above, one below, is absolutely great. Complex fractures, two above, two below, is a very good way to go and you have time and you don't have to go anterior necessarily. If a truly unstable burst fracture, uh, delay anterior surgeries, don't do these acutely. A couple of practical tips to close with. So I wanna talk about pedicle screws, remind you of alternatives of cables and hooks, and the power of laminectomy talk about anterior cervical surgery very briefly. And we'll not touch upon anterior thoracolumbar lumbar surgeries because we want to get you out into the labs. This is what we want to avoid. Again, um, I realize that we don't all have great imaging systems and things like that, but I think most of this could have been avoided uh, with very simple things. Fortunately, this patient actually did well. If you have no fluoro, that's no problem, I think. Um, the magic tools that we have can make this happen. This is Ladies and gentlemen, magic tool number one, a Penfield 4, and this is magic tool number two, a Woodson dissector. How do we use these? We do small laminotomies or laminectomies, and basically, uh, you basically establish the medial pedicle wall, you locate the foramen above and below, and with these tools, you can then very safely advance pedicle screws in. And you can avoid a mishap like this. So just by having a medical finder here immediately, you can make sure that there's no broach. A laminotomy, depending upon your technique, is something that takes about five to 10 minutes, uh, but it's, it can take far less if you do them very commonly, but you can establish the boundaries of the pedicle, and with your excellent skills, it's very analogous to the distal locking screw of the zircal nail. You use the power of proprioception and your 3D vision, which is excellent because of your uh, trade. You'll do a very good job with these. And the other magic probe is obviously the ball probe, uh, and learning to feel with metal is very important. Uh, uh, I want to thank Dr. Drazen again for handing out the starting spot uh, images, but I will show you something else in the lab that I think makes it even more predictable to place screws in a safe trajectory. I personally always recommend on your lateral x-rays in uh, the upper room to stay parallel to the upper end plate. It is and affords you the greatest likelihood of having a strong control of the vertebra. Um, these are just some images uh, to show um, pedicle screw placements that we did in an outside hospital. Um, the lateral breaches are um, feared, uh, but they're actually usually benign as long as you stay away from the great vessels. So converging your screws is always safer. And again, most lateral breaches you can identify very reliably with your probe. If you have a lateral breach, it's way safer than a medial breach in general. One of the most effective tools with simple x-rays, uh, I took this in a country without fluoroscopy, is an AP x-ray. 
So we actually took an AP fluoro shot in a very primitive eye. And as long as your screws stay within the medial boundaries of the lacquer wall and don't cross the midline, you're going to be safe. So you don't need a complex fluoroscopy. And again, as good as possible, a simple lateral x-ray. This is done with a very simple eye. The screws were parallel to the end plate. This gives me a great deal of biomechanical safety. One other suggestion I have is you don't need a thousand different screws. If you have a 40, 45, and a 50 millimeter screw, you can literally cover everything from pediatric cases to adults for a trauma situation. And the go-to screw is actually a 40 or 45 millimeter screw. If you have nothing else, a 40 or 5 mm, a 45 millimeter screw that parallel to the upper end plate in a slightly convergent fashion is an extremely powerful tool that is supreme to everything else. Finally, again, uh, not having rigid fixation is obviously a problem. Um, I got this from a different country, from a colleague there, and uh, that colleague did an absolutely beautiful job. They actually used a cast afterwards. He had absolutely nothing but uh, trauma plates. These are 4.5 trauma plates. This is a non-rigid fixation, meaning these screws are not coupled to the plates. The good news, and this was the thinking of my colleague, was this is very hard home, so you actually got a tremendous purchase of these conventional trauma plates. And again, this patient actually did very well. This was a uh, spinal cord injury patient. Don't forget hooks and cables. We can, again, practice that a little bit in the lab. Uh, do we have, Craig, do we have some hooks in the lab? Uh, we do have hooks, yeah. Super. I would recommend that, uh, uh, and uh, you can help us with that, Daniel, right? Uh, Downgoing transverse process hooks and some sublaminal hooks practices. Do we have any cables or something? As a, that's okay. But we can practice with a Woodson elevator how to pass cables. It's a very safe technique if you have nothing else left. One final thing with this, I'll close and uh, pass on to our Harborview colleagues again. Anterior cervical spine, how to make sure that you're really where you need to be. I recommend, again, the Penfield 4. If you identify the unsynthetic processes, left and right, and you properly elevate the longest call line, I want you to do that in the lab, and you put the Penfield 4 left and right, you know exactly where the midline is. If they're osteophytes, you resect them. They should not throw you off. Any osteophytes, resect them. And then if you have no fluoroscopy or x-rays, get your pen field for subperiosteally on the lateral surface of the unsynthetic process, and you know where midline is. You know if you do a decompression, you're not going to stray into the vertebral artery. So I hope you'll also, and this is an advertisement for ourselves, connect with us in the future use our free information materials, use our connectivity uh, to stay in touch with us. And we have to get a picture of this group afterwards, so do not pass here without filling out your questionnaire and getting a picture. Thank you.